Hello and welcome to the Top 3 Channel. Top 3 Channel is brought to you by Hopelify.org to inspire you to become the very best that you are designed to be. A few simple keys, mastered and consistently applied, are all you need to excel in each area of life. Hit the subscribe button to receive more Top 3 videos. Enjoy! Chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. I had been terrified of public speaking. I couldn't do it, I'd throw up. And I knew if I didn't cure it then, I'd never cure it. And so I saw an ad in the paper for the Dale Carnegie course, which worked on developing your ability to speak in public. And I went down there. Be sincere. A good smile has the same effect as a puppy's tail. When a puppy wags... They made us do all these crazy things to get out of ourselves, and so we stood on tables and did all kinds of things. If I hadn't have done that, my whole life would have been different. So in my office, you will not see the degree I got from the University of Nebraska. You'll not see the master's degree I got from Columbia University, but you'll see the little award certificate I got from... 72, I'm getting Social Security now, so, I, you know, I, I, I should be in Florida, you know, pushing shuffleboard around or something of the sort. But, but, but I do what I can do, anything in the world I want to do, but what I want to do is run Berkshire Hathaway. Now, why do I want to run it that way? I get to paint my own painting. I go down there every day, and I feel like, you know, I feel like Michelangelo there, you know, working on the Sistine Chapel or something. Nobody else may think it's a great painting, but I get to paint my own painting. I do not have people second-guessing me. I do not have people saying, why don't you use a little more red paint than blue paint? Why don't you paint a seascape instead of a landscape? I get to do my own thing. It's, it's, it's a form of creativity. It's, it's exactly like somebody feels it's a professional golfer or somebody feels it's a painter. They're not doing it for the money, primarily. Now, we've got a company, Flight Safety, that trains more pilots than anybody in the world. Flight Safety is run by an 85-year-old man, Al Yulshi. Al started the company with $10,000 in 1951. It now trains four or five times as many pilots as any, non-military pilots, as, any, as anybody in the world. And he is there at 85. It's a matter of public record. He's got a billion dollars worth of Berkshire shares. He works seven days a week. He loves it. And he loves it for the same reason that I love what I do. He gets to do it his way. He buys these big simulators that you train pilots in. He doesn't have to check with me as to whether to spend $15 million for a simulator. He doesn't ask me. He knows so much more about it than, 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 than I do. What, why in the world would he ask me? Well, I can't tell what kind of a plane I'm in, you know, when I'm flying around. And, and Al is spending a couple hundred million dollars a year on simulators, uh, spending Berkshire Hathaway money and he never checks with Omaha. He's never had to come to Omaha. Uh, for any kind of meetings, he runs his own business. And that's what he loves in life. And I let him do it. I mean, that's my contribution to it, is, is really turning loose his energies. And, you know, they were properly directed before we bought the company seven or eight years ago. Why, do, why should I think that, you know, he couldn't keep running it after that? And like I say, at 85, he's still running it. And that feeling of ownership is really extraordinary and it's so much better. I mean, it's the way I like to work uh, and it's the way, you know, it's the way uh, Susan Jock likes to work, it's the way Al Yoshi likes to work. You look around you at the people you admire, you know, they have certain qualities. I mean, you've got, you've got friends, why do you like them? You know, generally, you know, they, 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 generally they have an upbeat attitude on life. Generally, they are generous people, they're humorous people, they're people that do more than their share. They're people that are thinking about something nice they could do for you. And all of those qualities attract you. And none of those are, are innate at birth. I mean, you, you can acquire those. And then there's other people that turn you off. You know, and and uh, uh, they have habits, they take credit for things they didn't do, they don't show up on time, whatever it may be. They're a little dishonest about things. And if you're looking at your life at, at a young age like you are, and you can choose what kind of a person you can be, why not be the person you admire rather than the person you can't stand. It's so simple. So just write down the qualities you like. Take your, take your five best friends. Why do you like them? And just write down those qualities. And you will find there's no quality there that you can't have yourself. 
And similarly with the five people you can't stand to be around, <laughs> put, those, put those things down that turn you off about those people. And if they turn you off about them, why should you possess them? You're gonna, it's, it's so simple. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not like some, something complicated that you think you should be learning <laughs> with an advanced degree in school. It's not as complicated as investing in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's enormously important to have people work with you in life. They're going to work with you in life if they like you. you know? And they may occasionally, I mean, if you're in the army or something, you, know, you may work for somebody that you don't like. But by and large, you're going to get the best out of people if they feel good about you. And it's just so easy, but you've got to develop the habits early because you can't say I'm going to suddenly become a terribly attractive person when I'm 60. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Uh, so pick up the right habits now. And I will guarantee you, if you actually just write down those qualities and think about it, you will find you can have every one of the attractive qualities, get rid of the ones that are, are negative, and your life will be different. I was wondering how you define success personally. Well, I, I can certainly define happiness because that's what that's what I am. I mean, I, I and, and if that if that, <laughs> I mean, I get to do what I like to do every single day of the year, and I get to do it with people I like, and I get to the, I get to I don't have to associate with anybody causes my stomach to churn. At, uh, uh, and uh, the only thing in my job I don't like, and this only happens about every three or four years, occasionally I have to fire somebody, and I don't like, that's the only thing. Other than, I, I tap dance to work, and I get down there, and I think I'm supposed to lie on my back and paint the ceiling, you know, or something like my <laughs> so, I mean, it, that's the way I feel, and, I, and, and it, 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 it doesn't diminish. It, it's, it's tremendous fun, so, uh, you know, if uh, uh, they say that uh, uh, success is... Uh, 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 getting what you want and happiness is wanting what you get. Well, I don't know which one uh, applies in this case, but I, I do know that I, I wouldn't be doing anything else. I mean, that, uh, uh, I do advise you, you know, in, when you go out to work, go to, go to work for an organization that you admire, people you admire, because it'll, it'll, it'll turn you on, and, and, and uh, uh, you, you ought to be happy where you are working. And I always worry about people who say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this for 10 years, I really don't like it very well, and I'll do 10 more years of this. And rest. I mean, that's a little like saving up sex for your old age. I mean, <laughs> not, not, not a very good idea. <laughs> so get right in. So you get, would recommend that. Get right, get, right into, get right into what you enjoy, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> and you'll be successful at it. You really will. I mean, you, you won't be able to miss. And, uh, um, you know, that's... Uh, uh, I don't regard what I do as the most important thing in the world at all, but it's right for me. I mean, I happen to be wired in a certain way that what I do works in this. If I had to do what, you know, Bill does, I mean, <laughs> it lasts about 10 minutes. And uh, uh, that's true of a lot of things, but I, luckily I kind of stumbled into the thing that I, I, I do best, and, and that, you know, that, it's worked out well. I had students last week, 160 of them from Harvard and South, South Dakota State. I just tell them, try to find your passion. And, you know, I mean, may not find it the first time, but, you know, don't sleepwalk through life. Find something that you really enjoy doing if you can do it. And, not, you know, not everybody's lucky enough to be able to, to find that, but it's, it, it ought to be your goal. Uh, to make $10 a week more doing something that you don't feel good about, compared to something you'd feel good about, you know, make the change. Bill said something that I thought was really interesting. He said, the thing you do obsessively between age 13 and 18, that's the thing you have the most chance of being world class at. Yeah. Bill said his one thing was coding. What was your one obsessively? Well, I, I was pretty interested in investments. <laughs> so Bill and I, his father, many years ago, right after we met, had us a group of about 20 write down on a sheet of paper one word that they thought accounted for their success. And Bill and I, who may only met twice, didn't know what the other one was writing down. We both wrote down the same word, which was focus. And he was focused on software. I was focused on investments. And it, 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 it gave me a big advantage to start very young. There's no question about it. Well, move in the direction of the people that you associate with. So I, it's important to associate with people that are better than yourself. And actually, the most important decision many of you make, not all of you, will be the spouse you choose. Huh? And uh, you really, you want to, associate with people who are the kind of person you'd like to be. You'll, you'll move in that direction, and the most important person by far in that respect is your spouse. I, I can't overemphasize how important that is. You're right, the, the friends you have, uh, they will form you as you go.
through life and uh, uh, make some good friends, keep them for the rest of your life, but have them be people that you admire as well as like. <laughs> Warren, what do you consider the most important quality for an investment manager? It's a temperamental quality, not an intellectual quality. You, you don't need tons of IQ in this business. I mean, you have to have enough IQ to get from here to downtown Omaha, but, uh, but uh, you do not have to be able to play three-dimensional chess or, or be in the top leagues in terms of bridge playing or something of the sort. Uh, you need a stable personality. You need a temperament that neither derives great pleasure from being with the crowd or against the crowd. Because this is not a business where you take polls, it's a business where you think. And Ben Graham would say that you're not right or wrong because a thousand people agree with you. And you're not right or wrong because a thousand people disagree with you. You're right because your facts and your reasoning are right. Seventy years ago, I was in high school. Almost a third as long as the country has been around. And when I was in high school, I really only had two things on my mind. Girls and cars. <laughs> and. And I wasn't doing very well with girls, so we'll talk about cars. <laughs> but let's just imagine that when we finish, I'm going to let each one of you pick out the car of your choice. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, pick it out, any color, you name it, it'll be tied up with a bow, and it'll be at your house tomorrow. And you say, well, what's the catch? <laughs> and the catch is, that it's the only car you're going to get in your lifetime. Now, what are you going to do knowing that that's the only car you're ever going to have and you love that car? You're going to take care of it like you cannot believe. Now, what I'd like to suggest, you're not going to get only one car in your lifetime, but you're going to get one body and one mind, and that's all you're going to get. And that body and mind feels terrific now but it has to last you a lifetime. I would like to tell you of two women uh, that each sold the business to Berkshire Hathaway, uh, to me actually, for many, many, many millions of dollars. Both of them started with $2,500. By a coincidence, it was the exact same amount. It was everything they had in the world. And one of them was a woman who landed in Seattle in 1917, couldn't speak a word of English, had a tag around her neck. The tag said, uh, Fort Dodge, Iowa. The Red Cross got her to Fort Dodge where she was reunited with her husband who had come to the country a couple of years earlier. And she lived in Fort Dodge for two years. And as she put it, she felt like a dummy. She couldn't pick up the language. She couldn't learn a word. And so she decided, she and her husband decided to move to Omaha. So they came to Omaha in 1919. And there she found a small colony of Russian Jews. So she started feeling more at home. And then as her oldest daughter went to school, she would come home, this daughter, Frances, and she would teach her mother the words she learned in school that day. And this woman, Rose Brumpkin, spent 20 years saving money, bringing first her siblings over, her mother and father, $50 at a time. She sold used clothing to do it. She had four children during this period. And by 1937, after 20 years, she saved $2,500. She went to Chicago and she bought what she could of furniture. Her dream had always been to open a furniture store. And this woman without, who had never gone to school one day in her life with $2,500, but with the same spirit that the people in this room had about having a dream and working to accomplish that dream, she built a business which she <clears throat> sold to me in 1983 for $60 million approximately, and which, which did a billion and a half dollars worth of business last year. <clears throat> the fourth generation is working in that business. This woman, Rose Blumpkin, lived, well, she, she worked for me until she was 103. And 
then she, I'm not, said, then she retired and she died the next year, which is a lesson to all the Berkshire's managers. That premature retirement, you know, not, you can't tell what's going to happen. But Mrs. B, with her $2,500, one further fact about her, she could not read or write. And she went into a furniture business and she didn't bring anything in unique in furniture, but she brought a determination to succeed. She knew she could outwork anyone else. She knew that she cared about her customers. She worked at very low gross margins, but she built this incredible business. It takes three qualities, essentially to do well, and extremely well, actually, in this country. It takes intelligence, it takes energy, and it takes integrity. And I say, if you don't have integrity, you know, if we don't want to hire somebody that's got intelligence and energy if they don't have integrity. We'd rather hire somebody that's dumb and lazy uh, if they don't have integrity because they probably will never get around to cheating us or doing something. <laughs> and, and integrity is absolutely an option, you know. You may not be able to throw a football 60 yards, and you know, you may not be able to run the 100 in, in, in 9-8, you know, you may not be able to sink three pointers from, but you can choose where you stand on the integrity scale. You, know, you, can't, you weren't born wired one way or the other. That is an absolute choice you make. You have over a hundred billion dollars of cash. Um, Berkshire does that. Berkshire. Yeah. No, you won't. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you do. Um, you, Berkshire has over a hundred billion in cash and you say that you always want this company to be a fortress. So how much cash should an ordinary investor have on a percentage basis, do you think? It, it depends on their personal situation of it. it, it uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you're working in something where you're, you're living off your, your, your paycheck from, from week to week, you want to have a little cash around and, and you certainly don't want to have a credit card that's maxed out or anything like that. Uh, but if, you know, if, if your house is paid off, if you don't have big living expenses, you got a portfolio of, of decent diversified businesses, uh, you really need any cash. Just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of, of magazines. I read 10Ks. I read annual reports. And I read a lot of other things, too. So I, I, I've always enjoyed reading. I love reading biographies. I like to read more than most kids. I really like to read a lot. My Aunt Edie gave me a copy of the World Almanac. And that was heaven to me. And I can still tell you that the almost population was 214,006 in 1930. Some numbers just kind of stick with you. And very early, probably when I was seven or so, I took this book out of the Benson Library called A Thousand Ways to Make a Thousand Dollars. And one of the ways in this book was having penny weighing machines. And I sat and calculated how much it would cost to buy the first weighing machine and then how long it would take for the profit for that one to buy another one. And I would sit there and create these compound interest tables to figure out how long it would take me to have a weighing machine for every person in the world. The first books I read on investment were actually in my dad's office. Pretty soon I read all the books in the office and read some of them more than once. A few years ago, I went to Amazon and sure enough, they had this manual there. So. While reliving my youth, other guys were going to Amazon, probably, and, and uh, buying old Playboys or something, but I bought old Moody's manuals instead. And when I got out of school, I started selling stocks. I was 20 years old at the time and looked about 16 and acted about 12. So I was not the most impressive salesperson that anybody ever met. Uh, but what I would do was I, I went through page by page looking for possibly undervalued stocks. I should mention one thing about reading. Uh, it was at the library here at Columbia yeah. that I wish I spent probably more time than any other uh, student. Uh, I, I, I lived there practically, but you know, I pulled the book out there, happened to be Who's an American, and it told me something about my professor, Benjamin Graham, and then I looked up and I went to the library and I said, I want to look more, learn more about this because I learned this over here. Mm -hmm. That changed my whole life. You know, we own Geico now <laughs> uh, because of, uh, of that librarian directing me to some other book and then following through on that. I, it's the chance, I, I, I read about one-fifth the pace 
the bill does, but I still spend five or six hours a day reading. I mean, it just, you can learn so much. I particularly love biography, just to, you know, to be able to live the lives of these people that have been so, see them so extraordinary, the lessons and the, you know, the discouragements they face, just everything about it. So I did, I, you can't get enough of reading. I was just wondering, what is, what would you consider to be the worst investment you've ever made? The worst investment I ever made? Mm -hmm. How long do you have? <laughs> Oh, I, I've, I've made some very bad ones, but that doesn't really bother me. I, uh, you know, it uh, may bother the shareholders, but that's another question. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes in life. I mean, it, there's no question about it. You don't want to make them on the big decisions, you know, who you marry and so, some things like that. So there's no way I'm going to make a lot of business and investment decisions without making some mistakes. I may try to minimize them. I, I, don't, I don't dwell on them at all. I don't, I don't look back. Uh, the biggest mistakes are the ones that actually don't show up. They're the mistakes of omission rather than commission. We've never lost that much money on any one investment. Uh, uh, but it's the things that I knew enough to do that I didn't do. We have, we have missed profits of as much as, you know, maybe $10 billion in things that I knew enough to do and I didn't do. Now, the fact that I didn't buy Microsoft way back uh, is not a foregone opportunity because I didn't know enough to make that decision. But there have been other investments where I didn't know enough to make the decision and for one reason or another I either didn't do it at all or I did it on a small scale I was sucking my thumb when I should have been writing checks you know basically and and, and you know those don't show up yeah, there's no place where it shows missed opportunities but I've I've missed some big ones the triumphs in life are, are partly triumphs because you know that everything isn't going to be a triumph and, and, and uh, I, I would never get too hung up on mistakes. I know a lot of people that really agonize over them, and, and it, it just isn't worth it. I mean, tomorrow's another day, and you live it forward, and just go on to the next thing. You haven't bought the stock. You're an admirer of Jeff Bezos. A, a listing of the richest people in America came out. He's number one. I think your friend Bill Gates is number two. You're number three. So you can see what he's done in myriad ways. Yeah. And of course, the question is, how come you haven't bought Amazon? Is there still time to buy? Would you still buy? Oh, well, I, I always admired. Jeff, I mean, I met him 20 years ago or so, and, and and I thought he was something special, but I didn't realize you could go from books to what, what's happened there. No, I, I mean, he had a vision and executed in an incredible way, something that it, it would not have, you know, that, but there's a lot of games I miss. I, I would have missed, you know, I would have missed Microsoft even if I gotten to know Bill earlier or something. Those just aren't my games. I don't worry about the things that I miss that are outside my circle of competence of, of evaluating. I, I do, I have missed things that were within my circle and that's a terrible mistake. Those are my biggest mistakes. You haven't seen them. And, but I don't, it's not a mistake because I miss Netscape or something like that at all. There, I would say that maybe 5% of the companies or 10% of the companies at most are within an area of my circle of competence. There's something I should be able to understand. I've made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake, well, not the biggest, necessarily the biggest, but, but buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business. And I bought it very cheap. I'd been taught by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis, look around for things that are cheap. and. That I was taught that, we'll say in 1949 or 50, they made a big impression on me. So I went around looking for what I call used cigar butts of stocks. And the cigar butt approach to buying stocks is that you walk down the street and you're looking around for cigar butts and you find this, on the street, this terrible looking, soggy, ugly looking cigar. One puff left in it. But you pick it up and you get your one puff. It's disgusting, you throw it away, but it's free. I mean, it's cheap. And then you look around for another soggy, you know, one puff of cigarette. Well, that's what I did for years. It's a mistake. Uh, although, you can make money doing it, but you can't make it with big money. It's so much easier just to, to buy wonderful businesses. So now I would rather buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. But in those days, I was buying cheap stocks. And Berkshire was selling below its working capital per share. You got the plants for nothing. You got the machinery for nothing. You got the inventory and receivables at a discount. It was cheap. So I bought it, and 20 years later, I was still running a lousy business, and that money did not compound. You really want to be in a wonderful business, because the time is the friend of the wonderful business. You keep compounding, it keeps doing more business, and you keep making more money. 
time is the enemy of the lousy business. I could have sold Berkshire, perhaps liquidated it, and made a quick little profit, you know, one puff. But staying with those kind of businesses is, 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 is a big mistake. So you might say I learned something out of that mistake, and I would have been way better off taking what I did with Berkshire is I kept buying better businesses. I started the insurance business, Seize Candy, the Buffalo, all, all kinds of things. I would have been way better doing that with a, with a brand new little entity that I'd set up rather than using Berkshire as the platform. Now I've had a lot of fun out of it. I mean, everything in life seems to turn out for the better, so I, I, I don't have any complaints about that, but it was a dumb thing to do. I went into U.S. Air, I bought a preferred stock in 1989, uh, as soon as my check cleared, the company went into the red and never got out. I mean, it was a, a really dumb. I mean, it, it, uh, I've got an 800 number I call now whenever I think about buying an air, airline stock. I call them up any hour that, fortunately, I can call them at 3 in the morning, and I just dial and I say, my name's Warren, I'm an aeroholic, you know, and I'm thinking about buying this thing, and, and they talk me down. I mean, it takes out. <laughs> Takes, takes hours sometimes, but it's worth it, believe me. Uh, if you ever think about that airline, buying an airline stock, call me and I'll give you the 800 number, because you, know, you don't want to do it. Uh, but we got lucky in terms of how we eventually came out on it. But it was a dumb, dumb decision. All mine. How do you turn failure into a plus? Uh, and it's true, when I was at the University of Nebraska, one day I was reading the Daily Nebraskan, and it said, in room 300 or something, at three o'clock there will be this panel of three uh, uh, professors here at the university, and they're going to award the Nathan Gold Scholarship. I don't know whether you still you still have that around. And at the time, uh, it said it would give you $500 to go to the graduate school of your choice. I don't know whether it's changed in the mouth, but but that that was it. So I read this, and I went there to this room at three o'clock that day or whatever it was. And I walked in the room, and there were the professors, and I was the only student that showed up. I mean, it really got to them. I mean, they, they were stuck. They, they, you know, they kept waiting and looking at their watch and hoping there'd be more candidates, but there, no one came in. So I won $500 by, by default. And, uh, and those are usually my biggest triumphs when nobody else shows up. Uh, uh, and so here I was, I had $500 to go toward any, it wasn't, it wasn't limited, any, any graduate school uh, for a master's degree. So I applied to Harvard, my dad wanted me to. And uh, uh, I shortly heard from Harvard, and they said, go to Chicago and meet this fellow running the, who interviews applicants from the Midwest. So I got on the train, and uh, that's what you did in those days, and I spent uh, 10 hours on the Burlington going to Chicago. Then I transferred to another little interurban train to go up to this country day school where this fellow was the headmaster and he was the big interviewer for hiring. And I got there and after about 10 minutes he, he said, better think about something else. But, uh, you know, he uh, come back later on. I was, I was 19 at the time and uh, I looked about 12, you know, and, and, I, and I acted about eight. Uh, so I, it was not a great combination. Uh, but. So he, he said, forget it. So I spent, I uh, took a little interurban train back to Chicago, and I took the 10-hour train back to Omaha, and all the time I think, you know, what do I tell my parents? You know, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but it was, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. I, because if I'd gone to Harvard, I would have gone to a two-year business school. I, I, I instead applied to Columbia, where I could graduate in one year and get a master's degree. Luckily, that by the accident of it and being in the Nebraska National Guard, which did not get called up for the Korean War, I missed going in the Korean War. I, I got to meet Ben Graham, and, which had an enormous effect on me subsequently. And I probably got my wife that way because she was going to Northwestern. And I was able to put on sort of a full court press because I got out in one year. And otherwise, uh, She'd, she'd have met some other guy. I mean, I, I got her before the competition showed up. And uh, so it worked out wonderfully. It couldn't have worked out better. And that's been, that's been my life, basically. I mean, it, uh, things, you know, you will get some disappointments, you know. Uh, but the future is what counts. If I knew every decision I was 
going to make was going to be perfect. It would not be as much fun. It'd be like playing golf and knowing you're going to hit a hole in one on every hole. You wouldn't play golf if every time you got on a tee, you just took a swing and the ball ended up in the hole. It'd be fun for a few days and you get, get on TV, but it, the, the game would not be any fun. Uh, so it's failure, you know, and I wouldn't even consider them failures, but they're, they're mistakes or whatever you want to call it. They're, they're part of the game. And in the end, you know, you go on and, and we've made plenty of mistakes in business. We'll make plenty more. And the, the you know, the Babe Ruth and, you know, for a long time, subsequently got eclipsed by a few fellows, but uh, he held the record for strikeouts. You know, so that held the record for home runs and was the highest baseball player until the modern era came along. Yeah, so it's, it's part of the game. If you take big swings, you know, you, you, you may, you may, uh, you're going to miss sometimes. Thank you for watching today's top three video. This channel is brought to you by HopeLify.org to inspire you to become the very best that you were designed to be. Remember, a few simple keys, mastered and consistently applied, are often all we need to excel in each area of life. You can help make this channel even better in three simple ways. One, subscribe to receive more top three videos. Two, leave a comment below to let me know what resonates with you from today's top three video. Or three, suggest a topic for a top three video that you will like for us to feature on this channel. Visit Hopelify.org to post your own inspirational content.